I think the late Tom Petty said it best when he penned the words, the waiting is the hardest part. The waiting is the hardest part. Who likes to wait? I don't. Stop signs. Those are the worst. (laughs) Out here on Sunset in Buffalo, oh man, at 5 p.m., the amazing Las Vegas drivers, oh, brings out the best, brings out the best in me. My wife, she, she is so happy when we get home and the football game is already recorded, meaning that we can fast forward through all the commercials, we can fast forward through all the replays, we can fast forward through halftime. So she only has to sit there for about an hour and a half instead of that long three hour waiting for that dumb football game to get over. What do you mean I can't get that package in two days? I know it's a custom shoe with my nickname on it, but why would you not be able to get it to me in two days? Everything should get to me in two days, right? The mobile app for Starbucks, oh, it's the best. I do a lot of my studying at Starbucks, and it's great when, you walk, when you're sitting there and you see someone walk in and you know they, they put their order in. They put it in on that mobile app. It's not ready. They have to wait for their drink when they came in. Oh, no. The fireworks that happen at that moment. It's great. We hate to wait. We hate to wait. I think it's always been true, but I think our quick pace society has made it even worse. But what about the hard stuff? What about the unexpected waiting? What about the waiting that we never saw coming? The waiting on a job because we were let go of our last one. The waiting on the test results or the waiting on God to do something for that prayer request that we have been praying for for years. Waiting, true waiting, I think, is the hardest part because in the waiting, we are not in control. We don't control how long it's going to take or the outcome that it's going to be. Waiting is the hardest part, and we hate not being in control. I think in some cases, the negative answer is almost easier to hear than the waiting for the negative answer. At least when we get the negative answer, we can do something about it, or at least we think we can do something about it. I don't know about you, but I have often found that how I respond to waiting at a stop sign for a commercial and and other insignificant times in my life is how I often respond to God when he has me wait. When he says no, when he says not yet, or when he's not giving me an answer, I often respond the same way, and I respond with complaining. I respond with ungratefulness. Much like a child who does not get what they want when they want it, I complain to God about having to wait for it. How do you respond when God has you wait? How do you respond when God says no? How do you respond in the waiting? Are you waiting well? Are you waiting well or are you waiting and complaining? That's what I want to talk about this morning. But before we do, would you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the truths that we find all throughout it. And I thank you, God, that in the waiting, there are things that we can do to wait well for you. Father, I ask that you teach us all more about you. You teach us all new things of what it is to wait well. We love you so much in your name. Amen. Throughout scripture, we find person after person after person waiting on God. Abraham waited for a promised son. Moses waited for God to rescue the Israelite people out of slavery. Joshua waited for the walls to come down. The world waited for the Messiah, Jesus, to be born. The disciples waited for their rabbi to conquer death. And the apostles waited for the return of Jesus. Many of us today are waiting on God. We are waiting for him to heal, for him to provide, for him to restore, for him to do a miracle, for him to do what only he could do. But how are you waiting for him? 
Is your waiting filled with complaining, filled with reminding God what he should do or why he should let you have what you want? Is your waiting filled with self-centered thoughts and actions? What does your waiting look like when you are waiting for God to do something only he can do? I believe there are hundreds of practical action steps that we can take and should take while we are waiting for God. If we are waiting on God to provide a steady job, we should be out looking and applying for that job. If we are waiting for test results to come back, we should study and research what the doctors say it may be so that if it comes back positive, we know what to do next. If we desire a relationship to be restored, we should ask and we should pray, God, what would you have me do to help restore that relationship and do it? In the hundreds of practical steps that can be done in the many waiting periods of life, I think there are three things that you can always do when waiting. No matter how long it takes, no matter the answer, no matter the outcome, when God has you waiting, I think there are three things that we can always do. And the first is this. You can always praise him. You can always praise him. This is what David writes in Psalm 34 while he is fleeing for his life from King Saul and waiting for God to fulfill his promised anointing for him to be king of Israel one day. This is what he wrote in Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. He was on the run for his life. He was waiting for a promise that God had given him through God's prophet. In the waiting for those, and in the waiting of those two things, he says, I will bless the Lord at all times. He doesn't say, I will bless the Lord at some times. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my mouth. His response to waiting on God to do what only he could do was to praise him. He could have chosen. He could have chosen to remind God, you promised me that I would be king. He could have gone back to God and said, how Are you allowing this evil king to come after me and try and take my life when you have promised me the kingship? David could have, but he didn't. He waited well for God to come through. He chose to praise God in the midst of the waiting. I'm not sure there is ever a time in our life that we do not have something to praise our God for. Let me say that in a different way. If Jesus has saved us and we are a chosen child of God, there is not a circumstance, trial, heart, or heartache that we cannot still praise him in. I'm not saying praise him for the trial and the heartache, but he is still worthy of our praise in the trial and in the heartache. One of the many stories of the New Testament believers that always blows me away is that of the Apostle Paul and Silas' wrongful imprisonment in Acts 16. We find Paul and Silas being obedient to God's call to travel to Macedonia to spread the gospel of Jesus there. Well, while they are there, they are accused, falsely accused, and thrown into prison. Read with me in Acts 16, 22 and 20, through 25. Acts 16, 22 through 25. It says this. The crowd rose up together against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off of them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet to the stocks. Verse 25. But about midnight... Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Their response to injustice, their response to being falsely accused, their response to being thrown into prison was to praise God. 
Let's, let's, not, let's not move past this for a second. Let's put ourselves in their shoes for a minute. Being beaten, as the scripture said, many times. Being thrown. Put yourself in that position that you are thrown into the deep part of the prison. From what we know of history, prisons were disgusting. Prisons were foul. Prisons were dark. Prisons were cold. Prisons were wet. Put yourself in that scenario and ask yourself the question, would your first response be to praise God? I know if I'm honest, that would not be my first response. My first response would probably be to complain, to probably tell God why this is not fair, to tell him that I was serving him on the mission field. How could he allow this in my life? But yet, they choose to praise. How quickly are we, when things don't go our way, to complain to God instead of praise him? Here's the interesting thing about this. We know the end of the story. In their praising, God breaks open the jail cells, and they are free. They didn't know that. They didn't know that's what God was going to do because they were praising have you ever thought about this? No character in scripture ever knew the outcome to what, to when they were going to be obedient to God. Only Jesus. Only Jesus knew the outcome. Everyone else, when they were obedient to what God asked them to do, they didn't know how long, they didn't know when, they didn't know how, they didn't know if God was ever going to answer their prayers or answer their praises. The Apostle Paul and Silas did not know how long they were going to be in that dark, stinky, cold prison cell. Yet they chose to praise God in the midst of the circumstance. Paul and Silas waited well for God because they knew the God they were waiting on. They were not praising God so that he would save them. They were praising God because he had already saved them. Why do you praise God? Why is your life lived out in praise for God? Is it so that he will give you what you want and what you desire? Or is it because he has already given you everything you would ever need or desire in him? There is never a circumstance, trial, or heartache that we cannot still praise God in. We can always praise him for who he is and what he has already done. There's something that stood out to me as I was reading this text over and over and over again. At the end, it says, and the prisoners were listening to them. People are watching your life. People are watching how you respond to different situations in your life. If you call yourself a Christian, if people know you go to church, if you are a follower of Christ, people are watching People are listening to how you respond to what God might allow to happen in and through your life. How are you waiting? How are you waiting? Later on in his ministry, the Apostle Paul would write these words to the church that was started out of that missionary journey. He writes this to them, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Rejoice. Not rejoice in the Lord sometimes. Not rejoice in the Lord when things are going your way. Not rejoice in the Lord when you feel like it. Rejoice in the Lord always. Because of who God is and what he has already done for you on the cross, there is never a time where you cannot rejoice in him. Not in the pain, in the waiting, but for the joy that comes in knowing the one you are waiting on. Where in life are you waiting on God? Where in life does God have you in a place that you are dependent upon him and waiting upon him to answer? How are you waiting? Where can you praise him for what he has already done for you instead of complaining about what he's not doing for you? Maybe your complaining comes because you don't really know the God you are complaining to. You know some things about him, but you don't really know him. This leads me to what else you do, to wait well while you, are, while you are waiting on God. You pursue him. 
What else do you do when you are waiting on God to wait well? You pursue him. Lamentations 3.25 says this. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him, to the soul who seeks him. Not just knows some facts about him, not just reads every once in a while, not just comes to church when it's the right time, but is good to the soul who seeks him. The interesting part about this text is this is written by the prophet Jeremiah written in Lamentations when the Babylonians had destroyed Jerusalem. Almost the, rest, the entire rest of the book of Lamentations talks about the destruction. One person said, how many times can, can the writer describe how bad it really is? And yet we find these verses. This verse in Lamentations 3.25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him to the soul who seeks him. It is while the prophet was mourning over the waiting and waiting on God to restore Israel that he wrote these words. It was not in a good time, but it's during the hard time. I've often found that in my own life, when things are going well, everyone is healthy, bills are paid, my pursuit of God is not as strong as it could be. In talking with others, they agree. Comfort often brings complacency. Comfort often brings complacency. We start to depend upon our ability to provide. We forget the frailty of life. And I think for a lot of us, including myself at times, our comfort becomes our God. Comfort becomes our God. I'm not saying this is true for every situation, but I'm wondering if God doesn't allow waiting or hard times for this exact reason, to remind us we need him. To remind us we need him. We need him daily, not just in the hard times. We need him in the good times just as much as we do in the hard times of waiting. At the same time, I know that hard times in life also tend to make us question and doubt God and his love for us. This is exactly what Satan would want you to believe. Does God love you? Because if he loves you, he would not want you to wait this long. When we do not pursue God in the good times, it is easier to start to believe that lie in the hard times of waiting. There are hundreds of lies that the enemy loves to whisper to us. You don't deserve this. If God loved you, he would give you what you want. Doesn't God want you to be happy? You shouldn't have to wait this long for God if he really loved you. It is when we believe these lies and doubt God's love for us that we start to complain, focus on self and what we deserve and miss out on what God is really doing and teaching us through the times of waiting on him. One of the greatest examples we have of someone pursuing God in the waiting is Daniel. Most of us know the outcome of the story of Daniel in the lion's den, but do you know what he chose to do in the middle of the story and every day prior? Look at Daniel 10, 6.10 with me. Daniel 6.10 says this, but when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room. With its windows open toward Jerusalem, he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. As usual and just as he had always done are huge statements not to be missed. And in fact, I think it's the key to this whole section of scripture. Just as he had always done, Daniel went back. He went back to the same place that he had knelt down hundreds, if not thousands of times before and prayed and praised the God he served. In the midst of knowing the outcome could be his life, he goes back and he pursues God. He pursues him just as he had always done. Can that be said of us? Can that be said of us? 
That when the hard times hit, when the waiting happens, we go back and pursue our God just as we always have. In the waiting, Daniel chose to pursue God. He did not complain to God about the new law or go to the king and defend freedom of religion. No, he did what he had always done. He went and pursued God. Notice what it says at the end of the text. It says this, giving thanks to his God. In the waiting, in the waiting, in the knowing that if he did what he was doing in that moment could cost him his life, he gave thanks and he praised his Savior. Not only did he continue to pursue his God, but he continued to praise God in in the midst of the circumstances. We don't know. The text does not tell us how long it was from the time that he first knelt down to pray to when he was actually caught. It could have been days. It could have been weeks. But in the waiting, Daniel pursued God. Why do you pursue God? Is it to get what you want? Or is it to get to know more of God? You see, Daniel, from what we know, did not pursue God to get what he wanted. He pursued God to get more of God. We don't find anywhere in that area of that text of him saying, God, please let this law change. God, please, may it not be so. No, he went back and he did just as he had done every other day. He pursued God. How you pursue God in the good times will most likely be how you pursue him in the hard times of waiting. Where in your life can you see that you need to pursue God more? What are some practical steps you could take to pursue God in the good times so that when the waiting comes, not if the waiting comes, but when the waiting comes, you pursue him well? Ultimately, I believe it is our pursuit of God that leads us to be able to praise him in the hard times of waiting. It is in the pursuit that you get to know him more. And the more you know about God, the more you know how much there is to praise him for. So what else do you do when God has you waiting? What else do you do when God has you waiting and in the hard times? You trust him. You trust him. Psalm 910 says this. Those who know your name Those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Not those who know something about your name. Those who know your name. How well do you know the Lord? Those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. I believe there is a direct correlation between knowing God and trusting him. You will not trust him if you do not know him. Pastor Paul has said it many times from this stage. Your trust in God will never go beyond your knowledge of God. Your trust in God will never go beyond your knowledge of God. I think a lot of our prayers are, God, I want to trust you more. God, I want my faith to grow. God, I want to have more faith in you. And all along, God is saying, get to know me more. The more you get to know me, the more you will trust me. The more you get to know who I am and how great I am and how powerful I am, the more you will have faith in me in the good times and in the bad times. The Apostle Paul's prayer for the believers in Rome was this. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Then you will overflow with confident hope. I believe that when we know God for who he really is, trusting in him brings eternal peace in any situation. True eternal hope, which is only found in God, is the only thing that can bring joy and peace in long, painful times of waiting. More money, more things, more relationships will not bring eternal joy and peace because they are all temporal. Only trusting an eternal God will we ever find eternal joy and peace. The interesting thing is I think we have this trust thing backwards. 
I think we believe that if we pursue God, and in the pursuing we praise God, and out of the praising we believe that God, that we can trust that God will give us what we want. See, our equation is this. Pursue plus praise equals I get what I want. And that's not true. That's not true. Pursuing and praising God does not equal I get what I want. It equals I am at peace with whatever the outcome is. Not because I'm okay with whatever the outcome is, but because I know who controls the outcome. Hear that again. Not just because I'm okay with whatever outcome there is, but I'm okay because I know the one who controls the outcome. My hope, my joy, my peace is not wrapped up in what I'm going to get or what I'm not going to get. It is wrapped up in God. My trust in the outcome comes from the trustworthiness of the one whom I'm putting my trust in. I'm not so smart, and I had to sit with that sentence for a long time, so I'm going to read it again. My trust in the outcome comes from the trustworthiness of the one whom I'm putting my trust in. Do you know? Do you know who you are putting your trust in? If I believe God is trustworthy, then I'm going to trust in the outcome he sees fit. We don't trust God to give us what we want. We trust God that whatever he gives us is what is good. I don't know who said it or where I heard it, but someone once said that nothing happens to one of God's children that has not already gone through the approving hand of God. That's a tough one. Nothing has happened to one, of the to one of God's children that has not gone, that has not sifted through the approving hand of God. If your Savior is Jesus Christ, there is not a single thing that does not happen without God's approval for your good. We may not see it as good, but because he is good, we can trust that it is for our good. That is why we will never truly trust him if we do not fully get to know him. Trusting in him is trusting his wisdom, his goodness, his plan, and that he is God and we are not. He is God and we are not. So what do you do? What do you do when God has you wait? Do you just wait and just hope for the best or do you wait well? I believe waiting well is you never stop praising him for who he is and what he has done for you. You never stop pursuing him and getting to know who he is. And you always trust him, knowing that he is God and we are not. Pursuing him leads to praising him, which leads to trusting him. And I believe that is how we wait well in any situation in this life. Would you pray with me? Jesus, what a gift it is that because of how good you are, because of how great you are, because of how much you have loved us, we can trust you. What a gift it is that an eternal, all-powerful God allows us to have a relationship with him, that we can pursue him, that we can know him. God, I pray that we are a church that pursues you well, is able to praise you in any and every circumstance and that we will trust you with whatever the outcome is going to be. God, I thank you that as we wait for you, we can trust you. We love you so much in your name. Amen.